Welcome. Um, yeah. My name is uh, Patrick Alexander. I'm the founder of WP Beco. It's an all-in-one WordPress platform. And essentially what we do is we, we create, we, uh, it's, a, it's a one stop for everything WordPress related. And what sets us apart from the others that do similar things, are we train you, we provide training, and we have a one of a kind staging environment to help anyone that needs to get their website created. So for our platform, they get their themes, plugins, everything that they need. Uh, let's see. All right, do I need to speak up or? Well, the microphone's for the camera. Oh, the microphone's for the camera. Yeah. All right, well, that's good. So I'm going to have to really speak louder, which I actually can do. <laughs> All right. So as you guys can tell, I have an accent. I'm from the island of Dominica. And prior to a month ago, I'd have to explain to you that it's not Dominican Republic. But it got hit really, really bad by Hurricane Maria. And unfortunately, that's one, that's one of the things that put us on the map. So you know where Dominica is. And uh, if any of, any of you are interested in helping the country get back on its feet, you can donate right here at dominicamariarelief.com. All right, so a little bit enough about me. Another quick thing about me is I have been doing this for over, uh, it's been over 20 years, since 95. So and I have experience in every area of, of IT. All right, so what are we here for today? We're here to speak about the 10 biggest mistakes after launching your website. And those of you who made it to this talk, you're in for a treat. It's actually not 10, but 21. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and when I'm done, you don't have to feel too bad because I gave this same talk in, in New York about two weeks ago. And one of the questions I was asked I was asked, how many, mis how many of these mistakes have you actually made? I had to think about it. I made actually every single one of them. <laughs> so that's actually why I came up with this talk. Our very first big mistake is backup. All right, so if you fail to plan, plan to fail. Uh, we're all familiar with, uh, what's it called? The law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, all right? Yes. Yes, yes. If you if you want to follow along right here, you go wpbco.com forward slash blog. It's gonna be the very, very first slide. I just uploaded it about ten minutes ago. So the very first one. WP so you go to wpbco.com forward slash blog. And the very, very first link is, is this talk. All right. So the first mistake most people make is you forget to create a backup. You spend all your time and money creating a website. The very first thing you want to do is to back it up. And for backups, backups is very, very interesting. I actually gave a talk, I have a separate talk, just on backup. And something you're gonna realize as well is that the entire 21 list I'm gonna go through, they, they each can be separate talks. With backups, you have two options. You can back it up manually, especially for your very, when your website is just launched, I highly recommend doing it manually, if you know how to do it, because WordPress, is what is called an open source data database driven application. What that means is that it has a lot of moving parts. It has the database, it has the web files, it has files that you upload. And to back it up manually, you have to back up the database and the files. If you use a plugin, a plugin can actually break your site. It shouldn't, but it can because it's, again, developed by anyone that might not have followed the right procedures. So your very first go of your website, you want to have a manual backup of it. In addition to that, I remember a few years ago, someone said that 
they backed up their website, guess where? On the exact same server. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a backup. That's, that's actually a disaster waiting to happen. Right? So you have to back up your website offline. You don't back it up on your computer, on a separate server, anywhere but the exact same server. If you're going to use a plugin, there's two of them that I've used that are pretty decent. I like the all-in-one WP migration. It literally takes everything. That one is pretty cool. And I believe I've used uh, Duplicator, I think it's called. That is a, that's a pretty good one as well. So the very first thing you do is to back up your site. The next one is security. So some of us like to live on the edge, right? living dangerously. The very first thing when it comes to security, again, before you attempt any security measure on your website, you ought to back it up. Once it's backed up, then you have to ensure that all your plugins are up to date. And even if you're not using WordPress, this, again, this 21 can be used, needs to be followed for any type of website. So if you use any modules, you want to ensure that your everything, modules, plugins are up to date. Because WordPress themselves update, set an update what? Every four months, there's an WordPress update. So if WordPress is up to date, but your modules are not up to date, your, your website is not secure. And in addition to that, in addition to having your modules up, your plugins up to date, if you're going to install any plugin and you see it was last updated two years ago, install at your own risk. You, want to, you really want to use plugins that the developers are keeping it up to date because there's always a security vulnerability. All right, in addition to having your plugins up to date, if any of you caught the talk before, the talk specifically on security, one of the things you want to ensure that you have is SSL. And prior to two years ago, most of you would argue that you don't need SSL if there's no payments taking place on your website, or no one is logging in, and there's no secure information on your website. So a lot of people tend to make that argument. However, in 2017, that argument is no longer true. You want to have SSL to ensure that your website, one, is not used as a tool for another hacker to use as a launching pad. In addition to that, I know all of you want your website to be indexed by Google. So Google actually started or will rank your site lower than other sites if it doesn't have SSL. And if you're not yet convinced, if you go to any website on a new, on an updated browser like Firefox or Chrome, there's a big exclamation mark saying, this website is not secure. And again, you might have some advanced knowledge about security and you, you might think, okay, well, it's not taking any data. However, if that is your website and an average user goes to your website and they get that notification, they will leave your website. So if anything, you want to ensure that your users feel a sense of security when they get to your website. So you want to have SSL. The next thing, that we have is comments, unwanted comments. And I'm sure if you're a developer, you are familiar with that, where you just get spammed all the time. And there are various reasons for that. So you want to ensure that your website, when you create a, web, a, a page or a post in WordPress, there's a default setting that says to allow comment. If you, quick, if you click on quick edit, if this is checked, it needs to be unchecked. So you won't get unwanted comments. Now, the reason that every post or page by default allows this is because WordPress originally was created as a blogging platform. And if you're blogging, you may want comments on your blogs. 
All right, so two ways to do it. That's one of the ways. The other way is to use a plugin to disable comments or to watch for unwanted comments. And comments is a big deal. What you're probably going to get is that I actually really don't like them. They're really annoying. <laughs> Because most of the websites we create for clients are not blogging websites. Now, if you want to ensure that every page or post that you create, does, this is not enabled, you go to the settings. And this, at the top right here, it says, allow people to post comments on new articles. You want to ensure that this is not checked as well. Again, more of those comments that I really don't like. So you ensure that actually in your settings you do not allow comments, but you're still getting comments. Another key reason for that is that you would create a blog, you would create a contact form or any form that someone has to put data in there, and you're missing this right here. It's called a, a capture. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with captures. If you go on most sites when you fill out a form, it's asking you to verify numbers or pictures. The reason for that is there are what is called bots that persons use to just fill out these forms automatically. So what this is ensuring is that an actual human being is actually entering, is actually fill out this form. So you only get wanted comments or wanted forms. So you want to actually use a capture plugin to, to do that, and there are a bunch of them. The next, we have permalinks. Now, most themes, most templates that you use with WordPress nowadays, they actually have this set by default. Some of them don't. And what that is, is permalinks, you create a web, you, you have your, your URL, and by default, it says something like ID equals, kind of looks like this, if you can see it. Instead of actually having the name of the page at the end, it has a number. And that is not user friendly. And if you're concerned about SEO, that actually affects your SEO. And the reason for this, the reason this used to be like this by default, as I mentioned earlier, WordPress is a database-driven application. What that means is most of the content is stored in a database. And the ID is referencing the location where that information is stored in the database. In the database. And I'm sure many of you didn't, didn't actually want to hear that explanation. Right? So your users actually do not really need to know where your information is. So what you want to do is to enable permalinks so that you can have a nice, friendly. So if, you're, if you want them to go to your contact page, you go to the permalink settings, and you set, you set it to be like this, post name or custom structure. And whatever URL you have, it'll be url.com slash blog slash contact, and the actual name of your page will show up. So you need to make sure this is checked. The next issue is SEO and sitemap. So all of us, whenever we create a website, we actually want it to be found or indexed by Google or the other search engines. With that said, the way to ensure this is done is you need to have your keyword set and one of the plugins you typically want to have is Yoast. It actually guides you on what to have on there and how to get this set up. So in addition to having Yoast to guide you to have your keyword set up or any other plugin that does keywords, you also want to have what is called a sitemap. How many of you know what is a, a sitemap? OK, half of you. A sitemap essentially is a listing of all your pages and posts that you want your that you want the search engines to index. And it is important that you create it because when your website is new, brand new, 
the search engines doesn't know anything about your website. So you, the first thing you want to do is to create a sitemap to actually send to the search engines or to submit to the search engines. And that is what I'm discussing. Well, I'll discuss it in the slide after this one. All right, so you have your sitemap ready to go. Another key feature that many of us miss is actually had some, some clients or, yeah, some prospects. They would tell me that their website cannot be found. Well, they, 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 they would put in their name of the website and they cannot find it. And many times when I actually took a look, this was the culprit. So by default, you have it saying in your settings, by default it said discourage search engines from indexing your website. So you're essentially telling Google and the other search engines to ignore my website. And you may be wondering why this is set like this. The reason is that typically if you're creating your website on most of the, the hosting companies, your domain is already live. So unless you actually have a staging a development environment that is not exposed, anyone that has your domain name can actually find your website while you're creating it. So while you're creating your website, you may want this to be set. Yes? Um, are you going to talk a little bit about Google's sort of console note integration? Because creating the sitemap, one, I think it's important to note that there's a difference between an HTML sitemap that a lot of people confuse between an XML mm -hmm. version, which is what the engines actually read. Right. So that's an important distinction in how that gets generated. Yeah. And also not waiting for it to do, but being very proactive in submitting it via Google Search Console. Correct. That's another huge mistake a lot of people do. They do the, if I go yeah, to we, the yeah, we, we'll get to it. Yeah. So you actually just made me present that my, my, this slide should be before. So the, the slides are kind of and not in. at the page level as well. Yeah. Because you may have pages that you want to exclude. Right. So you want to make sure if you are excluding it, you have a no follow or a no index. Otherwise. Great. Yeah, so we're going to discuss that in the next slide. Great. <laughs> All right. So this is where you want to make sure that before you launch a website, this is not checked. Because it's discouraging search engines from checking your, from indexing your website. So what she was talking about is what we're going to discuss here. So your website is brand new. The search engines do not know that your website exists. So you want to be proactive and to actually let, actually let them be aware of your website. So what you do is you use the a sitemap, sitemap plugin to create a sitemap, and you actually submit that sitemap to both Google and Bing. The way you do it with Google, you use what is called Google Webmasters Tools, and you log in. And it's kind of intuitive. Essentially, you need to have a sitemap created. And a sitemap, the file that's created by most of the plugins is sitemap.xml. And you just kind of follow the instructions. You upload your sitemap, and you submit it to, to Google. To do it with Bing is similar. You use what is called Bing Webmaster Tools. And you follow a similar process. And the reason for doing that is that you're actually letting them know that your website exists. OK? So it's almost like registering your website with those search engines. The next thing you want to do is, all right, just to be politically correct, you want to cover your area. What that, <laughs> what that looks like is that you create your website. You submitted it, and you want to see what is out there about your website. And the way you do this is this right here. I hope you can see it. It's called, you put in site, the name of your domain, in Google, and you search. And it shows you every result, every page that is out there about your website. And that is important because sometimes we believe that only the the pages that's in our menu shows up. 
that is not true. If you create a test page or make it worse, there's some plugins that actually look at a scan the potential client side recently. And every every image, the directory structure was exposed to the internet. You don't want that to happen. You only what the reason you're using this tool is to ensure that every page or content that's exposed to the internet about your website is what you want to be out there. And if that's not the case, then you go back, you either delete the page, you put it in draft mode, all right? And the next thing you do is, is this right here. So let's say you, you made a change to your pages and you want to let, you, you made a change to your pages or your website is brand new and you want the search engine to actually find your content, you can use this tool to force traffic to go to your website. And again, the traffic to your website is what everybody wants. That's the reason that there's social media and all of these campaigns to get people to go to your website. The traffic that you do a, a, an entire marketing campaign to get to your website is organic traffic. This is not organic. So you want to use this tool carefully. This is, so you go to this web URL called Ping Farm, and you put in your URL, and you send what is called a mass ping to your website. So you send a bunch of traffic to your website, the search engines recognize that, and they would quickly index your website. All right, so your website is brand new, or you made a change, you want to send traffic to it, so that it can be indexed quickly by the search engines. Yes? If it's not new, it's the next slide. <laughs> All right, too much, much, with great power comes great responsibility. If you abuse this tool, your website will get blacklisted. Okay, it's not organic traffic. If you want traffic to go to, go to your website, you go on a, an entire online marketing campaign, you use emails, social media, Instagram, whatever it is, flyers to get people to actually go to your website. Do not abuse this tool because your website will get blacklisted. When it's new or if you made a change? Now, if you are always making changes to your website like every day, then do not do it. <laughs> what if I'm adding something new on the homepage, WordPress? How often do you do that? If it's a, if you, oh. all right. Maybe every 90, it's like really a common sense thing. Because again, what it does is that it sends traffic to your site. That traffic is not organic. So if you just decide, you know, I want to beat the system to get a higher ranking, you cannot beat the system. Your website will get blacklisted. So you basically use it responsibly. Yeah. I would not suggest to use this for that reason. You will likely get blacklisted. I notice whenever I've launched a site and whenever I've just submitted a new XML, mm -hmm. Right. If you are publishing something, I would strongly urge you to use GQuest. It's often overlooked. Okay. And it indexes very quickly on Google. Yeah. The most important thing you have to do is learn Google Search Console and right. read it and pay attention. And if you do that, you'll probably see where you're not being read. You may have errors that are preventing index. I, I just think that the biggest mistake that people make with SEO is they try to rush it. Yeah. So again, so what I was saying, this is not for SEO, and that's what I'm saying, not abuse it, right? Your website is new, you want it to be indexed quickly by the search engines, you can use this one time, you'll be okay. It's if you just decide, it's just, you're gonna get blacklisted. And if you want traffic to your website organically, you research online marketing, and uh, again, that's a different talk altogether. Yeah. Pay for it or just pay for it or invest the time. This is not an SEO tool. 
right? However, if you, you realize that, hey, a login, username, and password, especially if you're a developer using an API, for example, which is bad practice to actually have a username and password in a file that's exposed, or you saw something in your website that you do not want to be out there, if you update your sitemap or your website is new, you can use this tool real quick. But as I said, do not abuse it. Yes? Is there anything stopping someone else from using Ping Pong <laughs> for your site? <laughs> you? That's it. <laughs> Again, it, it's one of the, I guess it's really a catch 22, right? Anybody can use anything for malicious purposes. So if your competitor wants to take you down, <laughs> or if you want to take your competitor down, right? <laughs> yeah, again, knowledge is power, right? That's all I can say. We have the information. Do not do it to someone. Do not do it to someone. <laughs> so the, other, the next one is, you launch a website. It's out there. And I know many of us want to monetize our website, so you want to keep track. You want to actually gather analytics about your website. That's what Facebook does. That's what Google does. And you want to do that. So if you use what is called Google Analytics, then you can do just that. You can keep track of who went to your website, where they, where they came from, what device they were using, their age group. right? You can get all that information from using Google Analytics. and to get Google Analytics on your website, you need to have a Google Analytics ID that you get from Google Analytics. And you use a plugin, or some of the themes actually has a space for you to enter that ID. OK? So you install Google Analytics on your website, and you set up a Google Analytics account. All right, so your website is live but you're asleep. So again, I'm sure many of us create our websites to make money or for it to be profitable. And a neat little trick is you want to see who may be talking about the things that you're selling, products or services, on your website. Or you might want to keep tabs on your competitor. This is a neat little tool to do that. It's called Google Alerts. And what that is is that, again, you get a Google Alerts. You need a Gmail account to do that. And you Google, Google Alerts. What this does is you put in a search term. For example, like our platform, one of the ways that one of the persons, people that we like to connect with is people training, training persons to use WordPress. So we have a search term called WordPress training. Whenever that comes up on Google, we get an email about it. So we can reach out to these people and say, hey, we have this great product. So they're saving with you. If you have something that if someone is talking about it, you want to be notified, you use this. Some persons actually put it on their name, right? especially if you have a unique name. If you're going to use this tool, you want to be specific. Don't just say time. If you put a word like time in there, you're just going to get but a thousand emails, right? So you have to use a specific phrase that you want to be alerted about. And this is called Google Alerts. So let's just do a quick recap, all right, a checklist review. The first thing you want to do when you want to launch a website is to back it up. You want to update all your plugins and WordPress version. You want to disable all comments and enable capture. You want to enable permalinks. I want to have your SEO keywords in there and your sitemap. You want to submit your URL to and sitemap to the search engines. You want to actually check what content is out there about you or your, your website by using this command right here. And something else that you want to ensure when you're putting this in. So a few years ago, it was a priority to actually have www in front of a URL name. A lot of times these days, that's not the case. So exactly the way your URL appears in the browser, if you want to see the contents that's there, this is how you put it in. So the site and however 
your URL appears in the browser. You want to, use, you want, you want to do quick indexing, you use Ping Farm. You also want to use Google Analytics and Google Alerts. It's 4 o'clock. Oh, it's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, that is my laptop. All right, thank you for that reminder. So I have some bonuses for you guys. After you set up your website, you may have a limited budget where you do not want to pay uh, Gmail or Google Suites or Outlook 365 for a Gmail account for an email, a professional email address. So you can actually use this strategy where you set up your your Gmail, your, your, e your professional email with your host, and you actually use Gmail to send and receive emails, right? And that's how you do it. So you have your, your name at your domain.com. You do not want to spend anything additional to use to set up Google Suites or Outlook 365. You can use this format <coughs> to actually use Gmail to send and receive emails using your professional email address. The only caveat after you're done doing this, whenever you're going to reply or send using Gmail, you want to actually select your professional email account. All right, and if you're interested in it, if you actually Google this, it will give you a step-by-step -step way to do that. Okay. The next bonus is Monitoring, monitoring your website. So a lot of the, the hosting providers might tell you that they have what is called 99.9% uptime. And if you don't trust them too much or you don't believe them, you can use a tool like this to actually monitor it yourself. So it's called uptimerobot.com. It's actually free. You go in there, you just put in your URL and your email. And if your website ever goes down, your host ever goes down, he'll get an email notifying you that your website is down. So that's a neat little tool to have. With that said, it doesn't monitor if your database is down or if there's an error on your page. You'll have to use a different advanced tool to do that, to monitor that. All right, and I know I said I promised you guys 10, but it's really 21. So what I tend to do at this point in the talk, just to avoid what I call information overload, I leave this up here. And if you have any questions in relation to this or what I spoke about before, I'll answer it. However, in addition to that, one of my favorite phrases is that Google is your friend. So you're just going to Google what I have here, the different lists. And, uh, you'll get more information about what I have here. But these are 21 things you really want to do after you launch a website, especially if you want it to be profitable, safe, secure, quick, everything that you'd want your website to be. And I'll take questions at this point. A WordPress website, and it goes directly to spam. It goes directly to spam. If that's happening to you, you need to have that plugin. So what it does is that it, it enables, it verifies that you are allowed to send information, emails from that email address. So it actually authenticates you. You have to have your username and password for whatever domain or email host that you're using. So not because your website is one place, it necessarily means that your email Silver is the exact same place. And if you're not using it, you're not aware of it, you want to use that plugin to ensure that your email sent to you from your website does not end up in a spam folder. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. 